In 428 BC, a man lays dying on the battlefield. He is an Athenian strategos and politician, a man that, according to some, reached his position by virtue of the woman he is leaving behind. He perishes, and she fades with him. Historians will agree later that she most likely died in 401 or 400 BC, but nobody can know for sure, because this woman is unknowable. She was the mistress and perhaps wife of Pericles, preeminent Athenian scholar and politician. She was the mother of a general, the muse and target of playwrights and philosophers, the great model of Greek women in her time and for many years that followed. She has no birth, no death. The backbone of her life are the words others wrote about her. As the loyal wife, the scheming mistress, the magnetic orator, the ambitious whore. Depending on who you listen to, she was all these things. Perhaps she was none of them. Perhaps she was even more. She is a woman who now lives in the hypothesis, and I can't possibly wrestle history back into her hands. But I can gather the evidence for you, and you can decide the conclusions. Let's start at the beginning. Before all the words, the wars, before Athens, before history, she was Aspasia of Miletus. Let's talk about the living muse. To map out Aspasia's childhood, we have to work backwards from what we know of her as an adult. She was born in the Greek city of Miletus sometime between 470 to 460 BC to a man named Axiochus, mother unknown. Her name means welcome, and likely was not the one she was born with, considering how neatly it complements her later profession, but perhaps her parents were prophetic. There are some sources that tell us she was a prisoner of war of Caria, a nearby region that had been colonized by the Greeks, before they in turn turned her into a slave, but given what we know, this is fairly unlikely. Higher education was barred to both women and slaves in most of Greece at that time, which would have made Aspasia doubly damned. Miletus, however, was a bit more lax with its rules towards women's education, especially those who could afford it, and Aspasia, if nothing else, was educated. Ergo, she was likely raised in a wealthy family from Miletus that gave her the connections and tutors she needed. There's an interesting theory as to how she eventually left her hometown that posits that Alcibiades, not the famous one, but his grandfather, traveled to Miletus after his exile from Athens, where he met and married the older sister of Aspasia. When Athens allowed his return, he brought both sisters with him. The interest in this comes from the fact that Alcibiades was related through his famous family, the Alcmaeonidae, to many prominent men in Athens and abroad, including a certain man named Pericles. Regardless of how she got there, or how she would eventually meet one of the most powerful men in Athens, Aspasia immigrated to the city circa 450 BC. She was, at a rough and most generous estimate in our timeline, around 20. There, she likely became a hetiri, the Greek version of a courtesan. The profession would have fit her well. Hetiri were atypically educated and independent amongst their gender at that time. They provided art, entertainment, and were even allowed in the symposium, a place of drinking, discussion, and debate that women were otherwise forbidden from attending. Above even her intelligence and shrewdness, most contemporary sources agreed that Aspasia was outspoken, with a certain magnetism that drew men and women alike to her. She quickly made herself a prominent figure in Athenian society, well-connected and well-funded enough to own and operate her own brothel. Her foreigner status meant that while she was barred from certain privileges, she was also not required to follow the same rules that bound Athenian women. Aspasia could live her life in the public sphere with no censure, which she did with apparent relish. That undoubtedly made her unpopular to some, but it drew the eyes of many more. One of those many was Pericles, a popular general and orator who would be named as the first citizen of Athens. He was an incredibly influential man in the reign of Athens' golden age, and a hero to the city. He was also nearly 50 years old, and quite possibly still married at the time he met and fell in love with Aspasia, though the latter situation was quickly remedied when he divorced his first wife around 450 BC. Whoever Aspasia was, devil, angel, perfectly normal human being, Pericles was absolutely gobsmacked by her, in awe. Whether you take the words of his critics that he was an emotionally weak fool being led by his nose by a scheming instigator, 
or those that admired him who credited her influence and advice, Pericles was very clearly taken with her. It was said that Pericles kissed her every time he left and returned to his house, and that he wasted almost all his property and money on her. By 445, she was living with him full-time, although as a foreigner she couldn't marry him, thanks to laws pushed by Pericles himself. In 440, she gave birth to their son, Pericles the Younger. We don't know how Aspasia felt toward Pericles, not truly, but she was independent and clever, she had her choice of men. She chose, and stayed, with Pericles. Now if that was just a bit too domestically sweet for you, don't worry. All was not well on the public front. Backstory first. The Greek world was actually several small states in close proximity to each other, and they were constantly squabbling. Two neighbors would battle it out one decade only to join up in a league with each other to fight another foe the next. Pericles had come into power in 461 BC, and he had already led Athens in the First Peloponnesian War, heading the Delian League against Sparta and its Peloponnesian League. That ended in the so-called Thirty Years' Peace Treaty between Sparta and Athens in 445 BC, right when Pericles was settling down with Aspasia. The peace, while it would not live up to its full name, did hold for a time, but where Sparta lay quiet, other forces stirred. In 440, the city-state of Samos went to war with Miletus over control of the city Priene. As their condition worsened, the Milesians came to Athens to ask them for help in treating with Samos. Athens ordered both sides to stop fighting immediately, but Samos refused, prompting Pericles to order an expedition into the city. The Athenians crushed Samos' forces in a naval battle and assumed rule over the city. The Samians were predictably not thrilled over their new administration and revolted. The whole conflict took another eight months to resolve, leading to discontent not only in Samos, but amongst Pericles' own forces. And that would have been that, just another run-of-the-mill Greek conflict. But some wondered. What caused the Simeon War? Why did Pericles choose to attack? Who in his circle might have prompted him to do so? Was it not the Milesian, Aspasia? Would not Pericles do anything to satisfy her? The Simeon War, and the suspicions that followed, is Exhibit A of the enigma that was Aspasia, was she the immoral seductress that led a great man to every mistake he made, as some would assert? Or was she a supportive woman of great eloquence and intelligence, as was supported by others? Aspasia was the frequent target of comedic playwrights who relentlessly disparaged her origins, her friends, and her influence over Pericles, and her reputation suffered greatly in the decade between the Simeon and the Second Peloponnesian Wars, to the point where she was possibly even put on trial. The accusation levied against her was actually that she was influencing the women of Athens to play to Pericles' perversions, or as they put it, impiety. Whether this trial took place at all is debatable. Aspasia was not Athenian, and as such likely would not have been accused of those particular charges, although Pericles might have been on her behalf. The accounts of the trial that do exist, however, report that Pericles defended her with fervor and all his skills as orator, to the point of tears, and she was acquitted. Legally, Aspasia was safe, but the attacks did not stop. The Thirty Years' Peace collapsed in 431 BC, with the beginning of the Second Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens. Historians would lay the blame on Pericles for starting the conflict, but Aristophanes and Doris, two contemporary Greek historians, went so far as to blame Aspasia herself, accusing her of manipulating Pericles to exclude the city-state of Megara from trade, as payback for Megarian attacks against her house, which kick-started the conflict. Whoever the instigator was, they began a war that lasted 27 years, and saw the deaths of not only thousands of people, but the Greek Golden Age. That, however, is another story. Now the four horsemen were running rampant over the Greek world, and Athens would feel the brunt of their hooves more quickly and more keenly than most. Pericles had chosen to fight the Peloponnesian War primarily on the sea, and the Athenians retreated within the city while their navy battled with Sparta. That meant that the city was overcrowded, and that meant that resources were short. It was the perfect storm for disaster when plague arrived in the city in 430 BC. It ravaged the population, killing upwards of 75,000 people and leading to a breakdown in morality and a strict tightening of the laws. 
The plague devastated the Athenians militarily as well. Where before they were looking forward to a short end to the war, now they were broken, vulnerable, and in for a much longer battle than they had ever planned for. Still, Pericles persisted, Aspasia at his side. At the end of that first year of war, he gave his famous funeral oration, a beautiful speech to commemorate the fallen that was intended to rouse the spirits of the Athenians as they faced further conflict. Interestingly, authorship of the oration was occasionally attributed to Aspasia, though, as it often was in regards to her achievements, this was actually an attack on Pericles' abilities. His speech swayed the Athenians to his side, and he was named once again Strategos for the city. Pretty speeches do not end a plague, however, and it had further victims to claim. Pericles lost his two legitimate sons, as well as his sister, in 429 BC, a loss so great that even infallible Aspasia was said to be unable to console him. The long years of personal attacks, war, leadership, and grief, as well as the strength of the plague, proved too much for the man. Pericles died later that year, leaving Aspasia and their now legitimized son on their own. Aspasia essentially disappears after Pericles' death. There is some evidence from contemporary dialogues that she lived with an Athenian general named Lysicles until his own death in 428 BC, but after that, Aspasia is gone, perfectly preserved within that moment of time she lived with Pericles, and otherwise, a ghost. A myth. No historical figure is allowed to simply be. They never remain the person they were, instead becoming an embodiment of the ideals or the flaws in those ideals of the time. And when you are one thing to every person, eventually you become everything. Aspasia was no different, still isn't different. As you might have noticed, I've likely told you more about Pericles than I have her, because the details about her actual life are quite sparse, with what we do know mostly revolving around him, and some of that coming down to he said, he said. We're never going to know the truth of Aspasia as a person, and everything we do know is from the mouths of men with their own agendas and biases. For some, she was merely a method of attack against Pericles, a condemnation of his personal life. His skills came from her because he was flawed. His mistakes came from her because he was weak. For others, she was the exception among women at the time. Not just a special woman, no, she was the most clever, the wittiest, a wise counselor and a fantastic orator of impeccable manner, an authority on the domestic sphere, what Greek women could only aspire to be. The satirist Lucian went so far as to call her a model of wisdom. But sometimes even that praise is actually meant for Pericles, for having the insight to choose such a marvelous woman to stand beside him. Aspasia's date of death is unknown. Her place of burial is unknown. All that is left is the impact she had. And maybe that gives us the most important clue about the person she was. Because whatever the truth is, she was special. Special enough on her own to linger in our memory far past her own lifetime. 400 years after her death, the philosopher Plutarch, never her biggest fan, nevertheless admired the influence and power she wielded, as well as the skill with words she must have had to leave the impression she did. After him, she would continue to be a source of fascination and debate for historical scholars up to the modern day. In the 18th and 19th centuries, several books, poems, and plays were written about her life and love with Pericles. She even featured prominently in the 2018 historical fiction RPG Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And now, I'm here, telling you her story because I think it deserves to be told. The person may be gone, but her essence remains. Deathless. Deathless.